questions on oral questions. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister tried to criticize us for asking questions on the Can Sino deal. It turns out we weren't the only ones with questions, Mr. Speaker. The Globe and Mail is reporting that the government's own vaccine task force recommended against working with Can Sino. The Prime Minister has said repeatedly that scientists were guiding the government's decision with respect to the vaccine. Why did this government make an exception? for the Chinese pharmaceutical giant, CanSino. The Honourable Minister. From the very beginning, Mr. Speaker, we stepped up for Canadians. We reached out to uh, procure potential vaccines from every possible source. We were not going to close any door uh, that would maybe help Canadians. We ended up, therefore, with seven uh, contracts signed with a diverse group of the top uh, vaccine manufacturers in the world. We will continue uh, to ensure we're doing everything we can based on the best advice of experts to get these vaccines to Canadians so we can get through this pandemic once and for all. I'm chef the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. But the first door the Prime Minister opened was with China. We also found out last week the government had been briefed on the security risks involving the Chinese company CanSino. The Prime Minister said that news report was making things up. Now we learn that the scientists agreed with the security experts on CanSino. So if the security experts were against partnering with China and the scientists were against partnering with China, why did the government partner with China? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we signed seven contracts uh, with different vaccine p producers from around the world in order to deliver uh, vaccines reliably to Canadians. And we uh, looked for all partnerships, including something that was a successful partnership in developing an Ebola vaccine uh, a number of years ago with CanSino. Uh, that one didn't pan out for a number of different reasons. But what we are left with is seven extraordinary contracts that have secured more more doses per capita for Canadians, potentially, than any other country in the world. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we lost five months on the China deal that the Prime Minister said didn't pan out. We didn't prioritize domestic vaccine production. The government didn't listen. Instead of pursuing a Made in Canada solution that was actually put forward by their own experts, the Liberals signed off on a partnership with CanSino. They put millions into a facility for that partnership that they were told wasn't ready for vaccine production. Why did this Prime Minister favour a Made in China solution instead of the Made in Canada solution their own experts were demanding? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we leaned on our experts, on the uh, immunity task force, on the vaccination task force, to make recommendations on what uh, we should do to ensure a solid supply of potential vaccines to Canadians. And that advice actually led us to being in the enviable position of having more doses uh, from more companies than just about any other country. And uh, we are hopeful to be receiving our first vaccinations next week. This is what a government that listens to experts and works hard for Canadians has been able to deliver. I'm chef, no the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, last week the New York Times illustrated how easy it was to access child pornography on an adult site. And they continue their activity because the federal government isn't doing anything about it. This company has its head office in Montreal. When will the Liberal government open an investigation onto this issue to protect our young people? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are working actively on the creation of new regulations to force online platforms to remove illegal content. That includes hate comments, child sexual exploitation and violent or extremist content. Our approach will ensure that illegal content will be removed quickly, the platforms will be monitored, and victims will have access to a quick, transparent and independent 
a process. We are working with our international partners on this initiative and will be putting forth the regulations as soon as possible. The opposition on mass, the deputy. In March, Canadian senators and MPs from four political parties sent a letter to the Minister of Justice calling for steps to be taken to deal with these companies producing pornographic material. With respect to age, verification of age, and the removal of content, when will the government take action to protect our young people from sexual exploitation? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, we are working actively at present on measures for new regulations to force online platforms to withdraw all illegal content, be it sexual exploitation of children, child pornography, or hateful comments. We will always be there to protect Canadians, and we are working on measures to put in place. The Honourable Member for belle chambly well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and allow me to say quickly that uh, the government has our support for all measures uh, to put an end to sexual exploitation of young people. On a different topic now, we know that the government could have had vaccines made in Canada and could have had adequate facilities. We know that it could have done without it could have synchronized its steps for approval. It could have taken a number of steps, but it didn't do so. To hide it under the carpet, the government is uh, buying 250 million doses for Quebec. That means some 30,000 uh, 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 doses. We can't even look after seniors in, say, Sherbrooke, for example. When are we going to take more action that's more than just cosmetic? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since the beginning, we have been working with scientists and experts who have made recommendations on how to protect Canadians. On their advice, we signed more contracts with more companies developing a vaccine than any other country, and we have secured scores of doses of vaccine more than any other country. Vaccine, vaccines could arrive as early as next week. Production is underway and we will be able to vaccinate uh, many, many Canadians in the start of uh, 2021. The Honourable Member, regardless of what's uh, already been done, it wasn't done well enough because there are delays. Now, with respect to the choices of the government, it's a false and dangerous sense of, sec of security but only 125,000 people will be uh, vaccinated, so that's inadequate, inadequate. Can the Prime Minister talk about uh, the plan and raise the issue on Thursday and come through with the uh, increased uh, health transfers as the Premiers are requesting? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are working to deliver vaccines as quickly as possible, and it, uh, of course, depends on production, by companies that will be providing these vaccines. With respect to, to the premiers, I have worked with them for the months now to deliver billions of dollars in assistance for the health care systems for alongside to the armed forces and the Red Cross. We will ensure that everything during the crisis that the provinces have everything they need from the federal government. I'm keen to Member for Burnaby South. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians were encouraged to hear that a small quantity of vaccines would be coming from Pfizer, but that's the problem. It's difficult to, to transport it, to, to store it, and we're very concerned for our seniors. They need to have access to the vaccine. The Moderna vaccine can help. What is the plan? for the Moderna vaccine to protect our seniors. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have worked with all vaccine companies to ensure that uh, we obtain doses quickly in compliance with all rules. There are four companies that are currently being assessed, including Pfizer and Moderna. We hope that uh, Pfizer the Pfizer vaccine will arrive shortly, and Moderna 
in the months to come. We know that it will take different types of vaccines uh, to help everyone, and that's why we're confident that we will be in a position to vaccinate 3 million Canadians uh, in early 2021. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians were encouraged by the announcement of a small quantity of Pfizer vaccines being available in Canada. But the Pfizer vaccine presents some problems. It's difficult to store and difficult to transport, and it won't be available for people who live outside of major Canadian cities. And I think about the outbreaks in Indigenous communities and rural and remote communities and the fact that they won't have access. The Moderna vaccine is promising in solving some of those problems. But we want to know what the plan is. So what is the plan for the Moderna vaccine to provide access to people who live outside of major cities? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Pfizer is in the news right now because uh, we are expecting to see uh, the first deliveries of those vaccines as early as next week, and we can start uh, working on the the, uh, the delivery of those vaccines, which are logistically uh, more complex. Uh, Moderna vaccine is a somewhat more simple vaccine to uh, to uh, transport and to administer. Uh, that is why uh, we are counting on the Moderna vaccine to be able to reach uh, further off communities and uh, and uh, Northern Canadians. Uh, that's why we are working very closely with Moderna to ensure uh, that we get those doses to them as quickly as possible. As I said, we're expecting millions of people to be vaccinated, the most vulnerable. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister has a big idea and it, it involves your bank account. She's very worried that Canadians are saving too much, even though those same savings are lent out to and invested in other job-creating businesses. So now she's looking for ideas on how the government can act to unlock those savings of Canadians. Does the government really believe that holding Canadians upside down by the ankles and shaking their change loose is a stimulus plan? The Honourable Minister of Finance. The Conservatives are misconstruing my words. It almost makes me wonder if they're doing it on purpose. The fact is, there is nothing dystopian or even very complicated about the idea of a preloaded stimulus. We all know that local small businesses are the heart of our economy. We all also know that because of physical distancing, we are unable to patronize them now. That is why, as soon as it is safe for our economy to fully reopen, our government is looking for ways to encourage Canadians to support our local small business. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Preloaded stimulus. It sounds like she wants to use Canadian savings as her own preloaded credit card. But uh, this is no surprise from a government that's running the biggest deficit in the G20 by far, even with the worst unemployment other than uh, Italy uh, and among the higher uh, rates of COVID mortality. But now the, the, the minister says she has no fiscal anchor. Instead, she has fiscal guardrails that will one day be attached to a fiscal anchor. Won't the anchor at the bottom of the sea pull those guardrails <laughs> off the edge of the cliff? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite still seems to have some trouble understanding why it's good economics to support our small businesses and to encourage Canadians to do that. So let me quote someone he might find a little more simpatico. Ontario's Conservative Premier Doug Ford. Here's what he's had to say. Now more than ever, we need to support our own. During COVID-19, business supported communities and healthcare workers. Now it's time for us to support them as consumers. I couldn't agree more. The Honourable Member for Shikutumi Rafior. Mr. Speaker, after days of being questioned by our party, the Liberals acted in haste to come up with some vaccines for Canadians. And it's only a tiny fraction of what's needed. Now, we know that the armed forces will be involved in the vaccination effort, including several from CFB Bagotville. How will the government distribute the vaccines to the members of the Canadian Armed Forces who fall under federal jurisdiction? 
the Honourable Minister. For every step of the way, we've been transparent with Canadians as we secured the most doses per capita, as we had the most uh, diverse portfolio for Canadians, as we planned with provinces and territories to distribute vaccines so they can deliver on their immunization responsibilities. And Mr. Speaker, we'll work with the federal organizations under our jurisdiction as well to ensure that everyone has access to a vaccine. Here, here. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, things are going so well in Canada that uh, several provinces are reviewing lockdown procedures. We won't be able to talk about economic recovery until people have immunity. Canadians deserve certainty, clarity and competency from their government. When will we develop herd immunity and how long will we be, continue to be in lockdown? The Honourable Minister. It's important that all Canadians look forward to immunization and indeed plan to get immunized when those immunizations are proven to be safe here in Canada. I want to thank the regulators at Health Canada who are working so hard to ensure that no matter what vaccine arrives, that it will not be deployed until it's proven to be safe. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think one of the things that will happen is ensuring that we don't share misinformation with Canadians about the risks of vaccination. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Justice Minister said, quote, we expect law enforcement to enforce Canada's laws. But a Canadian-based website has videos and images of people under 18 and children, children being exploited, abused, and raped. Videos are re-uploaded and stay on the website for years and years. The minister said the Liberals take gaps in the law seriously. So does the Minister for Public Safety think this is a so-called gap that needs to be fixed right now? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, let me, let me assure the member opposite that, that the sexual exploitation of children is among the most heinous of crimes, and we've been working very hard to ensure that we support law enforcement in every way with resources, not just for the RCMP, but for provincial and, and, and municipal police services as well, to make sure that they have the resources and the tools and authorities they need to combat this most heinous crime. And I've reached out to the RCMP and asked them to speak to the police of jurisdiction, in this case, in Quebec, in, in, in the City of Montreal, in in the province of Quebec to ensure that they have all the help that we can provide. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. But this is still happening right now. Some private sector companies are taking steps to protect youth and victims of abuse. Three major payment processors say they will or have cut off the website's ability to monetize child abuse. Victims say the website is, quote, making money off the worst moment in my life and, quote, became my trafficker. Experts say there's more than 62 million pieces of child abuse online. How many more children will be harmed so heinously before these Liberals act and this is stopped? The Honourable Minister. As a father of three girls and a legislator, I find profoundly inhuman the content of these platforms. This is why our government has been working for months with experts, non-governmental organizations and foreign governments to bring forward legislations to this House at the beginning of 2021. This new regulation will require online platforms, not just websites, to eliminate illegal content, including hate speech, child sexual exploitation, and violent or extremist content. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Deputy de Joliet. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Premiers will be meeting on Thursday to discuss health transfers. We're seeing the real consequences of federal underfunding in our hospitals. Now, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the official opposition is heckling again. He continues to heckle. Chamber, uh, we'll go back to the... Uh, the interpretation isn't working? Order. 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 We can't. We can't continue on. It's not possible to continue. We can't continue on until the noise is reduced. The honourable member for Joliet. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. While all of the premiers are meeting on Thursday to discuss health transfers, we're seeing the real consequences of federal underfunding in our hospitals. Because Ottawa is not doing its share and its part, Quebec is forced to make heartbreaking choices. Doctors are forced to choose who can be treated because there isn't enough staff to treat everyone. And Quebec is forced to cut its operating room capacity to 50%. It could drop to 30% quickly on Thursday. Will the government finally 
announce a sustainable increase in health transfers. The Honourable Minister of Health. Monsieur le Président, nous Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are supporting Canadians and the provinces. We have announced $19 billion under the Safe Start Recovery Program to help recover from COVID-19. The provinces must invest this funding to increase their capacity, their testing, contact tracing, and data collection. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, for every $10, only 15 that the federal government invests, only 15% goes to health. Now, every day we're seeing the COVID numbers, but what we don't see are people who don't have access to care, the number of people who can't have surgery or receive uh, cancer treatment, the number of people on waiting lists whose quality of life is deteriorating because of a shortage of healthcare workers, and that's what happens when healthcare is underfunded. One-time assistance won't help them. When is the government going to realize what's happening and increase health transfers in a sustainable way? The Honourable Minister. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, the federal government has been there for provinces and territories. In fact, eight out of every $10 spent on responding to COVID-19 has been spent by the federal government. We've been there for provinces and territories, Mr. Speaker, with direct transfers for things like testing, contact tracing, data management, but also to help with crisis through the investment of the Canadian Red Cross to go into nursing homes and support right on the ground to help bring out uh, bring down outbreaks. Mr. Speaker, we'll be there for provinces and territories. They need to spend the money to get ready for whatever comes next. Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Experts have testified about the devastating impact COVID-19 lockdown has had on the mental health of Canadians. Alcohol and substance abuse is exploding, so is domestic violence, opioid deaths and suicide. Some have described these impacts of COVID lockdown as epidemics in and of themselves. With Christmas fast approaching, a time when mental health is always an issue for many, and COVID lockdown still in place, does the government feel it's done enough to prevent a second wave of suicides, domestic violence, and overdoses over Christmas? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, for a very long time, we've been focusing on mental health and substance use in this government. In fact, we did more as a government than that previous government ever did on the issue of substance use. And I'm proud of the work that we've done, Mr. Speaker, to treat people who use substances like human beings. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you this. We have invested through COVID-19 by direct transfers to provinces and territories, by setting up Wellness Together, a federal support to overlay that transfer to provinces and territories. I would encourage all Canadians to visit wellnesstogether.ca to receive support and access to professionals to help them through this difficult time. Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. Tens of thousands of Canadians have been separated from immediate family members for months due to COVID lockdown and border closures, and there are 4 million Canadians who live alone. For some of these people, sitting alone through Christmas lockdown might exacerbate mental health issues. For Canadians who live alone and who are desperate to reunite with family during the holidays for the sake of their mental health, what advice is the federal government offering them on how to safely reunite and mitigate the mental health impacts of isolation while preventing the spread of COVID-19? Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, every step of the way, we've asked Canadians to sacrifice tremendously. We know that all across the world, in fact, people are sacrificing to contain COVID-19 and protect their loved ones. And I don't underestimate that sacrifice, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, I thank Canadians for protecting each other, for protecting their communities. There is light at the end of the tunnel, though. We do have successful vaccines coming on board. And Mr. Speaker, I will remind all Canadians that if you need help and you don't have access in your own particular jurisdiction, please reach out to wellnesstogether.ca of both both official languages and translation into 200 others. Deputy Desnathie Misnipme, Churchill River. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, during the 2015 and 2019 elections, and as recently as this summer, the Prime Minister repeated his now broken promise to lift all drinking water advisories by March 2021. The government has used COVID as cover, but that does not hold up under scrutiny. The member for Kenora has been in contact with several Indigenous community leaders in his riding who have been able to continue with infrastructure projects, including water, during the pandemic. Will the government admit that the clean drinking water promise to Indigenous people was empty from the beginning? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are not backing away from our commitment to ending all long-term drinking water advisories to First Nations on reserve, but instead making a more profound commitment to the long-term. In every 
community with a long-term water advisory, there's a project team, an action plan, and people dedicated to lifting it. And last week we announced $1.5 billion to accelerate the access to clean water in the short and the long term, as well as the stability necessary to ensure this occurs not only by spring 2021, but after that. While we can't underestimate the impact of COVID-19 on long-term drinking water timelines, we're optimistic. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week, instead of owning up to his own failure to Indigenous communities, the Prime Minister hid behind this minister and forced him to take responsibility for not meeting this March 2021 promise. When it was time for an election promise, the Prime Minister was more than glad to be in front of the camera and centre stage and to be in the spotlight. Now that this promise has been broken, he is nowhere to be found on this. Mr. Speaker, that is not leadership. How can Indigenous people trust the words of this Prime Minister and his government? The Honourable Member. The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me complete what I was about to say. While we can't underestimate the impact of COVID-19 on long-term drinking water timelines, we're optimistic that by spring 2021, the number of communities under long-term drinking water advisories will be down to 12. We're committed to working with these communities in partnership for the long-term. That's what the advi- that's what the announcement last week of $1.5 billion to communities was about. And yes, that is my responsibility to get it done as a Minister of the Crown. Honourable Member for Victoria. Today's report from the Parliamentary Budget Officer shows that any scenario where the Trans Mountain Pipeline would be profitable is a fantasy. Construction costs have soared to over $12 billion, and any additional climate action, like this government's own net zero legislation, will mean the project isn't viable. Yet the Prime Minister is determined to push ahead with this environmental and economic disaster. When will the Prime Minister stop selling this fantasy, throwing away billions of dollars, and instead make the investments we need to fight the climate crisis and create good, sustainable jobs? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, there are many factors that go into determining whether a pipeline is necessary. Uh, such as contractual support, shipper choice, the nature of the markets that would receive the products delivered by the pipeline. TMX is a good project that has created more than 7,000 jobs for Canadians. There is a very strong business case for the project and construction will continue. Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Not only is the Liberal pipeline wasting public funds, but their government is a laggard in terms of the climate crisis. In terms of the climate crisis, the Liberals are clearly failing. Canada is 55th out of 60 countries. It's embarrassing and irresponsible. In Quebec, a petition with 100,000 people signing it has just been tabled, and the Quebecers show that they want a lasting and green transition. When will the Liberals take the climate emergency seriously and invest in electric transportation and renewable energy? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. We've taken many measures nationally to address the climate emergency. And of course, it's something we are aware of. We have to do more. And in coming weeks, we are going to do more with a new plan to address climate change. For Scarborough Agent Court. As we continue to see record-breaking number of cases in regions across Canada, I know that families in my community of Scarborough Aging Court are concerned about the safety of their loved ones of all ages. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced that uh, 249,000 doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccines will be available in Canada before the end of the year. With hope on the horizon, what would the Minister of Health say to reassure families, not just in my riding, but in communities across Canada. The Honourable Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her very important question. Of course, the arrival of vaccines in Canada is a very hopeful symbol that the light is indeed at the end of the tunnel. And I know that families all across the country are worried about their loved ones, and I thank them for the incredible efforts they're taking to keep each other safe. Work is well underway with provinces and territories to make sure that we have a quick and efficient way to deploy these vaccines. I want to thank the provinces and territories for working at all levels to make sure that when vaccines arrive in Canada, we can deploy them. Mr. Speaker, 
We all read or heard fairy tales in our childhood. The most recent one is called Frank Bayless and His Liberal Friends. The story is simple but shocking. But the problem is that the main characters deny being friends, even if their actions show the opposite. And my question is simple. Did the minister award other contracts to shell companies like FTI, a company that was only created a few days before signing a $237 million contract for friend Frank Bayless, the Honourable Minister of Public Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the question. To date, we received more than 3 million ventilators for Canadians. And this is very important for our effort for all Canadians, for people in hospitals. It's very important, Mr. Speaker. Canadians, our government has stocked up on PPE and all sorts of medical equipment. Businesses from across this country have stepped up, and we are so grateful to those businesses and Canadians at large. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg or Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Bayless's ventilators weren't even approved by Health Canada when the government awarded the contract. And what's more, Bayless needed money and had to finance its buildings because it had issues. Did the government pay twice the price for these vent ventilators because Frank Bayless had financial issues? And this is, is this why they hid the extra in the overall price? The Honourable Minister of Public Services. That's an interesting story, Mr. Speaker, but that is not at all the case. After an in-depth examination by a group of independent experts, Mr. Speaker, we awarded a contract to FTI. It is for Canadians and hospitals, Mr. Speaker, that we did this, and we are here for Canadians. Thank you. For Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give the government the opportunity to clarify its policy on China. I have a very simple question and hope that it will be answered. Has the government already put in place its new framework on China? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for giving me the opportunity to talk about our policy with China. Mr. Speaker, Canadians who are watching at home understand that our relationship with China is both complex and multidimensional, Mr. Speaker. Canadians at home understand that China of 2020 is not the China of 2016, and that our strategy needs to evolve with the China which is evolving, Mr. Speaker. As I said many times in committees, the member asked me many questions. Our policy is based on our interests, on our values and principles, including human rights, and on building global partnership and abiding by international rules, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Wellington, Alton Hills. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that answer demonstrates why this government's policies are such a mess. They can't answer a simple question. Two weeks ago, the minister appeared in front of committee and gave contradictory messages. The Canadian press reported that the government had already put in place its new framework on China. The National Post at the same time reported that the government had yet to put in place this new framework. If we can't figure it out, and the media can't figure it out. How on earth is anyone else, including China, supposed to figure out this government's policy on China? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I think it's very clear. Canadians have figured out, Mr. Speaker. Maybe the opposition have not. But I can assure that Canadians understand that China of 2020 is not China of 2016, Mr. Speaker. And after two hours and a half of questioning, if they don't answer yet, I think they have a problem, Mr. Speaker, because Canadians understand. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, the court ordered the government to correct made legislation before December 18th, but the bill is paralyzed. The Liberal prorogued Parliament for six weeks, so they are to blame if time runs out. Nevertheless, the hostage taking of this work by the religious right is deplorable. There are vulnerable people waiting who are suffering. Will the government ensure that C7 passes in time without a gag order? Or does it think that the government, that the conservative needs to, conservative leader needs to call his fanatics back to order? The honourable minister, 
Mr. Speaker. We were very disappointed to see the Conservatives pursue their tactics to obstruct the legislation on MAID. We know, Mr. Speaker, that the large majority of Canadians believe that medical assistance in dying is a fundamental human right. It was the deadline was imposed by the Superior Court of Quebec, and the Conservatives are trying to deny the urgency of the situation. It's a serious situation, and the leader of the official opposition has to show his leadership in this respect. The Honourable Member for Laurentie Labelle. Mr. Speaker, the hostage taking of work by the Conservatives' religious right on made should serve us as a lesson. It shows why religion must be kept as far away from government affairs whenever possible. State secularism is fundamental, and this value must be protected. But yet, right now, the federal government is involved in a court challenge to fight state secularism in Quebec. Will it learn a lesson from what's happening today and stop taking Quebec taxpayers' money to do what? challenge the secularity of Quebec of Quebec the honorable minister of justice mr speaker we have a very clear position on this what i can tell you is that we're not participating in the court challenging quebec in the trial that is a case where quebecers are are being a, are, are challenging this legislation before the courts. That's their right, and we're following this case closely. For Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nicola. Mr. Speaker, during this pandemic, Canadians are ordering more and more through home delivery. But what they aren't able to order are all the fantastic beer, wine, and spirits made by our great Canadian producers. Liquor monopolies hide behind outdated rules to prevent people from buying what they want. And this government has done nothing to fix it. Today I tabled a bill to give people more choice and to free Canadian beer, wine, and spirits. At this critical time, Mr. Speaker, will the government support this bill to help Canadian businesses and their workers? The Honourable, the Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable colleague for his question. He knows full well our government is committed to reducing barriers between provinces and territories. That is why we negotiated the Canadian Free Trade Agreement. And we look forward to working with the members opposite to make sure we reduce red tape to create more opportunities for businesses and more importantly, more choices for Canadians. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Steveston, Richmond East. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pandemic job losses and economic downturns have significantly impacted young Canadians. The fall economic statement mentions phaseology like funding for new career opportunities and introducing additional measures. Well, here's the problem, Mr. Speaker. There's no details, no timelines, no assurances for our young people to know when and if they can get back to work. Will the minister end the platitudes and deliver details on job measures for young Canadians? The Honourable, the Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to appreciate the question, and that's why our government um, has been responding to the needs of youth. We know that COVID-19 has impacted all Canadians, and disproportionately certain segments, and young people are no exception. When it comes to the Canada summer jobs, jobs remain open and encourage young people to apply. When it comes to making sure that we had a moratorium on Canada student loans, uh, we were right there to make sure interest was not accumulating. When it came to young professional entrepreneurs, we increased funding to Futurepreneur so that young people can continue being part of the solution. Mr. Speaker, our government will continue working on behalf of all Canadians, including students and youth, and I thank the member for his concern. The Honourable Member for Barry, Springwater, Oro Medonte. Mr. Speaker, last week I had the pleasure of visiting Curio Exploration Hub, an innovative new child activity centre opened by the mother of two young children, Stephanie Stout. Ms. Stout is hardworking, entrepreneurial, woman who unfortunately through no fault of her own found herself opening her business during the pandemic. Ms. Stout is struggling to survive and keep her business open. As a new business, she does not qualify for any of the current government assistance programs. Ms. Stout has put her heart, 
soul and savings into this business. Why won't the government fix these flawed programs and help Ms. Stout? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, first of all, let me remind Canadians that our government has put in place an extensive safety net for Canadian businesses. I would argue no country in the world has put in place as extensive a safety net to support its businesses. The wage subsidy, the rent subsidy, SEBA. Now, Mr. Speaker, in putting together our programs, we need to balance integrity measures against the pressing need to support Canadian businesses. We are always looking at ways to improve the programs and are looking at particular cases that fall through the cracks. The Honourable Member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Mr. Speaker, last week, the Government of Canada made an announcement about an emergency loan for our entrepreneurs through SEBA. Our government has already served several agricultural and other businesses in my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell through the $40,000 loan with the possibility of writing off $10,000. Could the minister inform this House of other similar measures? The Honourable Minister of small businesses. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for his question. We announced that businesses can obtain a second emergency account loan of $20,000. We continue to support our SMEs in dealing with the pandemic by extending the wage subsidy and supporting them with our new rent assistance paid directly to tenants. We will continue to support businesses in Glengarry Prescott Russell. Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are growing ever more concerned about the ability of the government to distribute vaccines in a timely manner. Disturbing news has emerged that hackers are working to disrupt vaccine supply chains. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the United States is sounding the alarm. The consequences of inaction will be fatal to Canadians. What is the government doing to protect our vaccine supply from cybersecurity? threats. Good question. The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, we're so fortunate to have embedded in the Public Health Agency of Canada, Major General Fortin and 30 of his colleagues that have been working for months on our vaccine planning, including protecting the entire chain of vaccine delivery, including looking at the potential threats that exist to the vaccine security for Canadians. Mr. Speaker, we will stop at nothing to ensure that vaccines are safe and protected for use in Canada. Honourable Member for Abbotsford. The Prime Minister has until the end of next week to comply with the will of this House to block Huawei from using our 5G networks to spy on Canadians and undermine our national security. All of our Five Eyes partners, the US, UK, New Zealand, Australia, they've all agreed to restrict or ban Huawei. And yet here in Canada, the Prime Minister dithers, no backbone. When will the Prime Minister grow a spine and say no to Huawei? To say no! The Honourable, the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to remind the Honourable colleague that we are right now under the process of doing a comprehensive review of how to deploy 5G in a safe and secure manner. We have been abundantly clear that we will continue to work with our national security experts as well as our allies to make sure that we proceed in a manner that protects Canadians, their safety and well-being. And we've been absolutely clear that we never have and never will compromise on the safety of Canadians. The Honourable Banner, Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Mr. Speaker, a critical part of our economy involves businesses that make the machinery of business. We are world-class players in this field in southwestern Ontario, but face-to-face -face meetings are critical for Unifab, a Leamington employer that wants to expand, wants to double their size and add 150 good-paying jobs, but they need access to Michigan. His truckers can cross, cross the border daily, but he, as owner, can't without spending 14 days away from his business. No one is suggesting we compromise safety, 
but when will rapid testing be accessible at all of Canada's borders? The Honourable Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, it was uh, an opportunity to partner with the province of Alberta to pilot a study to understand the, the best way to test people at the border and combine that with quarantine. Because listen, at the end of the day, all Canadians expect us to ensure health safety at our borders, and that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. We're looking at the evidence, we're looking at the research, we'll have more to say when the research study concludes. The Honourable Member for York Centre. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, we've seen a rise in the number of hate-filled incidents where people have been harassed simply because of their race or religion. This is completely unacceptable and needs to stop. While some people view these incidents in isolation, we know that they have a broader impact on our wider community. I'm proud as the newly elected, elected parliamentarian to represent the very diverse verse riding of York Centre. It's home to synagogues, mosques and black churches, all of which are too often targets of anti-Semitic, Islamophobic or anti-black hate motivated crimes. I will always fight to ensure that all of my constituents can live, worship and pray openly, peacefully and without fear for their safety. Can the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness please update this House on what the government is doing to provide support for the security of all of our communities? Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member for York Centre for her excellent question and for her strong advocacy on behalf of her constituents and in the fight against hate. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians, regardless of their race, ethnicity or religion, should sit, feel safe where they live, work, gather and pray. And since forming government, we have quadrupled the funding under the Security Infrastructure Program to keep at-risk communities safe. And Mr. Speaker, just last week, as we announced in the fall economic statement, we're investing an additional $13 million to protect communities at risk from hate-motivated crimes by providing not-for-profit organizations such as places as worship, schools and community centers with funding. Our government will always support Canadians, ensuring that they can feel safe in their local communities, schools and places of worship. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, when the pandemic hit and frontline workers and hospitals were short on PPE and sanitizer, Canadian small business owners stepped up. Distillers and brewers started making hand sanitizer. They saved lives, and many did it all for free. But when the government came, when it came, came time for the government to order sanitizer, instead of giving these Canadian small businesses a chance to fill some orders, the Liberals sent over half a billion dollars to multinational corporations. Can the minister responsible explain what Canadian small businesses businesses need to do to get the support they deserve from this government. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that we want to support Made in Canada solutions. That is why we had a call of action to businesses across the country and many small businesses stepped up. And presently, approximately 50% of our procurement comes from Made in Canada solutions, from local businesses. That's up from virtually 0% in March. We're very proud of supporting Canadian businesses right across this country, and we'll continue to work with them and promote our Made in Canada uh, programs going forward. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's very tempting to ask about the Parliamentary Budget Office report from this morning that made it clear that the TMX pipeline only makes money if all climate actions fail. But we have another hot topic, and that's the government's attempts to evade the Basel Convention on the shipment of plastics and other non-hazardous waste. There are very clear rules coming into effect January 1st for Basel, but Canada is evading them by contracting with the United States, a party not a member of the Basel Convention. What will the Minister of Environment do to plug this loophole? The Honourable Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. Canada takes its international obligations on the management of weight very seriously. Canada took a leadership role in negotiating the amendments to the Basel Convention, and we tabled these amendments this fall. The United States is not presently a party to the Basel Convention on the transboundary movement of waste. The agreement that we are putting into place with the United States will ensure that waste that moves between our countries is handled in a manner that is consistent with the Basel Convention. Mr. Speaker, through this agreement, we can ensure that waste that moves between our two countries will be managed in an environmentally sound way. 